this study unit is devoted to PDP-11 addressing modes. A thorough understanding of these addressing modes is an important first step in learning how to program the PDP-11. One effective way you can learn addressing modes is to study the examples we're about to cover and then complete the exercises contained in your workbook. Therefore, before you proceed any further, make sure your workbook and a pencil are in a convenient location. Now, let's begin by reviewing some basic concepts related to addressing modes. As we noted earlier, each PDP-11 processor contains a set of general purpose registers. These GPRs play a vital role they allow the processor to access data stored anywhere in our PDP-11 system. This data may be stored in the CPU or in a memory location or in one of the I.O. device registers. Although register R7 is a general purpose register, it also functions as our program counter or PC. Let's review the function of the program counter. This PC is automatically incremented by two each time the processor fetches another instruction in the program. The new value appearing in the program counter is the address of the next instruction to be executed. In order to fetch the next instruction from memory, the CPU takes the address stored in the PC and transfers the address to its bus address register, or BAR. The instruction address can then be placed on the Unibus. The CPU retrieves the instruction from the addressed memory location and loads the instruction into its instruction register, or IR. The CPU then begins to decode the instruction. A portion of the decoded instruction tells the CPU what operation to perform. For example, it might tell the CPU to increment a certain value, or perhaps it might specify a clear or complement operation. We call this part of the instruction the operation code, or op code. Let's assume the CPU has decoded an increment instruction. Okay, the CPU now knows that it is to perform an increment operation. However, it must also be told how to locate the value, or operand, that is to be incremented. This function is handled by the remaining portion of our instruction. We call this part of the instruction the destination field, or DST. The destination field contains essential information that tells the CPU how to locate the operand. Now here's where our general purpose registers come into play. Three of the six bits in the destination field select any one of the eight general purpose registers. In other words, they specify which GPR is to be used in conjunction with this instruction. The other three bits in the destination field tell the CPU how that GPR is to be used so that the operand can be located. We refer to this as our addressing mode. As we'll see later on in this study unit, there are actually eight different ways of using the GPRs. For example, we can store an operand right in one of the processor's general purpose registers. This represents one of our eight addressing modes. Or we can store the address of an operand in one of the processor's GPRs. This address then directs the CPU to an operand stored in memory. We can also store a pointer in one of the GPRs. This pointer directs the CPU to a memory location that contains an address. This address, in turn, may send the CPU to an I.O. register that contains the desired operand. In each of these examples, the instruction tells the CPU which GPR is to be used and also specifies how that GPR is to be used. This combination of register and mode fields directs the CPU to operands stored anywhere in our PDP-11 system. This ties in with our earlier statement that all addressing within the PDP-11 is accomplished by way of the general purpose registers. Now that we've reviewed some simple concepts, Let's describe the eight basic addressing modes. We'll examine each of these modes and show you how they're used in combination with the GPRs to locate data. One possible way we can use the general purpose registers is to store the actual data or operands that we wish to modify. This addressing mode provides the quickest access to an operand. Since it's already stored in the CPU, there's no need to tie up the bus in order to retrieve the operand. 
How do we inform the processor that one of its GPRs contains an operand? Simple. By placing a zero in the mode field of our instruction word. This zero designates the first of our eight basic addressing modes. It tells the CPU that the register we've selected, in this case R3, contains the operand that we wish to modify. In this example, the instruction causes the CPU to increment the operand contained in register R3. Whenever we're writing programs, we use this notation to designate addressing mode zero. The symbol R sub n represents any one of our general purpose registers. These registers are typically referred to by names, such as R0, R1, R2, and so on. However, registers R6 and R7 are also referred to as the SP and PC. Remember, the SP is our hardware stack pointer, the PC is our program counter. In this example, we're using an increment instruction in combination with register R3. In other words, register R3 happens to contain the value or operand that we wish to increment. We've now covered one use of the general purpose registers. The necessary data can be located right in the register. This represents the first of our eight addressing modes. Let's look at another possible use of our GPRs. Most operands are stored outside the CPU, either in memory or in I.O. registers. Here we've stored an operand in a memory location, and now the CPU needs that operand in order to execute an instruction. How does the CPU locate the operand? Well, once again, we use our general purpose registers. However, this time we store the operand address in one of the GPRs. This address then directs the CPU to the desired operand. This example illustrates another use of our GPRs. They can store an operand address instead of the actual operand. How does the CPU know if a GPR contains an address of an operand? Well, that's simple enough. The number one is placed in the mode field of our instruction word. In this example, the instruction selects register R0 and specifies that R0 contains the address of an operand. Consequently, when addressing mode one is called for, the CPU takes an address stored in one of its GPRs and places the address on the bus to retrieve the operand. As we've noted in an earlier study unit, retrieval of the operand involves either a data I or data IP bus cycle. There are actually two different ways of specifying addressing mode one. We can place parentheses around the register number or the symbol at can be placed in front of the register. Either of these symbols designates mode one. In other words, register R0 contains the address of the operand we wish to increment. We've now covered two uses of the general purpose registers. They can contain the operand or they can contain the address of the operand. Now let's look at another use of our GPRs. Often a programmer needs to operate on a list or series of operands. Perhaps he needs to search through the list to locate a specific value, or perhaps he needs to update each value in the list. Is there an easy way of addressing lists of data? There is in the PDP-11. It's called the auto-increment mode or addressing mode two. Here's how the auto-increment mode works. The CPU enters the auto-increment mode whenever a two appears in the mode field of the instruction. In this example, register R4 has been selected for the auto-increment mode. Note that R4 contains an address that directs the processor to the first operand in our list. While the first operand is being retrieved, the processor automatically increments the value stored in R4. Note that our general purpose register now contains the address of the second operand in the list. Consequently, the next time this instruction is executed, the CPU retrieves the second operand. And the value in R4 is again automatically incremented. Now this GPR is addressing the third operand in our list. This process is repeated each time the instruction is executed. Hence, we can use the auto increment mode or mode two to efficiently step through lists of operands. 
There's one important point that should be remembered whenever we're using the auto increment mode. If our list of operands consists of words, the address stored in the GPR is incremented by two. This is necessary because each word operand occupies two address spaces. On the other hand, if the list of operands is made up of bytes, the address in the GPR is incremented only by one. Thus, in the top example, we're using the auto increment mode to step through a table of operands made up of bytes. In the lower example, we're again using the auto increment mode, but this time we're stepping through a table of words. Hence, the contents of the GPR are incremented by two. As we stated earlier, the auto increment mode occurs whenever a two appears in the mode field of our instruction. In this example, the opcode is CLRB. This opcode calls for a clear byte operation. Since this instruction is handling bytes, the address contained in R4 is only incremented by one. In this second example, we have again selected the auto increment mode, but now we're clearing full words. Because we are dealing with words, the address in R4 is incremented by two instead of by one. How does a programmer specify this auto increment addressing mode? Well, auto increment is specified by this symbol. The parentheses around register R sub N signify that this register contains an address of an operand. The plus sign indicates that this address is to be incremented after the operand is retrieved. This is an important point to remember. The address is incremented after retrieving the operand. It is not incremented before retrieving the operand. With the help of our two assistants, let's summarize some key points. We've now seen three uses of our general purpose registers. They can store operands, or they can store an address that directs the CPU to an operand. Or finally, they can store an address that is auto-incremented in order to step through a whole series of operands. We've just shown how the auto-increment mode can be used to step through a list of items stored in memory. Each time we retrieved an item from the list, the address stored in the GPR was automatically incremented so that it pointed to the next item in the list. By simply reversing this auto-increment function, we can step through this same list, but in the reverse order. In other words, we can use any of our GPRs for auto-decrementing. Let's see how this addressing mode works. The CPU enters the auto-decrement mode whenever a four appears in the mode field of an instruction word. When auto-decrement is called for, the processor first decrements the address stored in the GPR, then it uses this decremented address to locate the operand. In this example, register R5 directs us to the fourth item in the list. The next time the processor executes this instruction, the address stored in R5 is decremented once again. Notice that the new address now directs the CPU to the third item in the list. This action is repeated each time the CPU executes the instruction. Hence, it is possible to step through each item in the list, but in the reverse order. Before going any further, let's compare the auto-decrement and the auto-increment modes. Both the auto-increment and auto-decrement modes modify an address that is stored in one of our GPRs. With auto-increment, we first use this address to locate the operand, then the address is incremented so that it references the next operand in the list. This address is incremented by one if our operands consist of bytes. If the operands are full words, the address is incremented by two. On the other hand, when the auto decrement mode is selected, the address stored in the GPR is first decremented by one or by two. The decremented address is then used to locate the operand. These symbols designate the auto-increment and auto-decrement addressing modes. Notice the placement of the plus and minus signs. The auto-increment symbol indicates that the contents of register R5 are incremented after being used as the address of the operand. 
On the other hand, the auto decrement symbol indicates that the contents of R5 are decremented before being used as the address of the operand. Now, with the help of our two assistants, let's quickly recap the four addressing modes that we've now covered. First of all, we can store operands right in our general purpose registers. This gives the CPU immediate access to frequently used data. We can also store an operand address in one of these registers. This address then directs the CPU to a memory location that contains the operand. Finally, if we're working with lists of operands, we can select either the auto increment or auto decrement modes. These two addressing modes automatically modify an address contained in each of our general purpose registers. Each time the address is incremented or decremented, it advances us to the next operand in the list. As we noted earlier, operands can also be stored in our I.O. interface registers. Here we're showing two sets of I.O. registers. One set handles a card reader, the other set is used with a deck tape. Let's see how we can use another one of our basic addressing modes to access information contained in these registers. One possible way of accessing these registers is to place a table of I.O. device addresses in memory. Each entry in this table addresses a different set of device registers. For example, the second entry in the table supplies the starting address of the deck tape registers. Note that the CPU must still have some way of getting to this table of starting addresses since they are contained in memory. This can be accomplished by placing the starting address of the table in one of the CPU's general purpose registers. We might say that the GPR points to our table of device addresses stored in memory. This example illustrates another use of our GPRs. They can store a pointer which directs the processor to an address. Then when the address is retrieved, it directs the processor to the desired operand. Let's suppose we need to clear the card reader's status register and the deck tape status register. How could we go about it? Well, we begin by placing a pointer in one of the GPRs. In this example, we've selected register R3. The pointer stored in R3 directs the processor to the first entry in our table of device addresses. The CPU then retrieves this first entry from memory and uses the address to locate the card reader status register that it wishes to clear. While this is going on, the pointer stored in register R3 is automatically incremented by two. The new pointer can now be used to retrieve the second entry in our table of device addresses. Note that this second entry directs the CPU to the deck tapes status register. In summary, we can automatically increment a pointer stored in one of our GPRs in order to access a series of addresses contained in memory. Each address in turn directs the processor to an operand that is located in an I.O. register or in another area of memory. This series of operations describes another of our basic addressing modes. It's called the auto increment deferred mode. The key point to remember about this mode is that it's the pointer that's incremented rather than an address. In this example, we are addressing all I.O. status registers. This has been accomplished by placing each register's address in a table. Then we have only one address to worry about, the starting address of the table. We use this symbol to designate the auto increment deferred mode. The at sign denotes that this is a deferred addressing mode. In other words, register R3 contains a pointer to an address. The plus sign indicates that this pointer is incremented by two after the address is located. One final point. Whenever auto increment deferred is specified, a three appears in the mode field of our instruction word. Here register R3 has been selected for an auto increment deferred function. Before going on to the next addressing mode, let's explain why we have both an auto increment and an auto increment deferred mode. The auto increment mode can be used when we're working with a series of operands that are stored in consecutive locations. In this example, the GPR contains the address of the first operand. 
By automatically incrementing this address, it is possible to access each of the operands since they are stored in consecutive locations. The auto increment mode cannot be used to address operands that do not reside in adjoining locations. However, we can use the auto increment deferred mode for this purpose. Let's see why this is possible. When this deferred mode is used, the GPR contains a pointer to a table of addresses. Each address in this table then redirects the CPU to an operand located anywhere in the system. Consequently, by auto incrementing a pointer, it is possible to address a series of operands that are not stored in adjoining locations. Note that the pointer is always incremented by two since we're dealing with word addresses only. We've now described five addressing modes. Three of these modes may be used to access lists or tables of data. Addressing modes two and four accomplish this by auto-incrementing or auto-decrementing an address stored in one of the GPRs. Mode three, on the other hand, auto-increments a pointer rather than the actual address. There's another addressing mode which we haven't talked about that permits us to auto-decrement the pointer. This gives us another method for accessing lists of data and is called auto-decrement deferred or addressing mode five. We'll use this example to illustrate how auto-decrement deferred works. The CPU has already decoded a clear instruction that calls for addressing mode five. It responds by taking the pointer stored in a GPR and decrements this pointer by two. Then the processor uses the new pointer to locate an operand's address. This particular address happens to be stored in memory location 510. The processor retrieves this address and then uses it to locate operand A, which is stored in another area of memory. If the processor goes back and executes the same clear instruction a second time, it again decrements the pointer stored in R0. Now the pointer directs the CPU to memory location 506. The processor retrieves the address contained in that location and uses it to locate and clear operand B. If this clear instruction is executed a third time, the pointer is decremented once more and the CPU is now dispatched to operand C. This addressing mode is similar to the auto increment deferred mode described earlier, except that we've stepped through the table of addresses in the reverse order. Note that the operands we're retrieving do not have to reside in consecutive or adjoining storage locations. This is applicable whenever we use the deferred form of the auto increment or auto decrement modes. As we noted a little earlier, the CPU enters the auto decrement deferred mode whenever a five appears in the mode field of an instruction. Here the instruction has selected register R0 and has told the processor to auto decrement the pointer contained in this GPR. Remember, the pointer is always decremented by two regardless of whether we're using a word instruction or a byte instruction. Symbolically, we designate the auto decrement deferred mode as shown here. The at symbol denotes this is a deferred addressing mode. In other words, the register contains a pointer that defers us to an operand's address stored in memory. The minus sign is placed in front of the register because the pointer is decremented before it is used for retrieving an address. We've now described six of our eight basic addressing modes. Before going any further, we'll take a short break.